All right. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good to see one here this morning. Hope you had a good week. Uh, November is right around the corner, so here we go. We're in that stretch towards uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, extra busy time, so uh, getting prepared for that. Uh, this morning, we are delving right into it, you know. Um, are we going to finish the Old Testament today? No, we're not going to do it. We're going to wait. We're going to deviate one more week. Next week, we'll finish it up with uh, uh, Malachi. This week, we're going to be in the book of Zechariah. you got to know, we're in Zechariah. Oh, it's all right. I, I was testing you. Um, but we're pressing forward. So this is the... The next to the last book we're going to see in the Old Testament before then we delve into the New Testament, which is exciting. It's hard to believe that we have almost made it the entire way through the Old Testament, walking through it, and uh, we're going to continue in that journey today. Uh, the book of, of Zechariah is, there's like 14 chapters in it, so it's a good bit of substance in it. And this is just going to be an overview, so we can't spend a lot of time on everything, so we're just going to kind of you know, do it a chapter by chapter, a quickly, quick overview, walk through some verses, and basically just kind of give you the, um, the tent poles or the tools to better understand when reading this book. So, let's begin like usual, book of uh, Zechariah, the author, of course, we see uh, Zechariah, date of writing about 520 to 470 BC, and then the purpose, he is writing to these refugees, he's writing to these people who've come back from exile, and he's offering them some encouraging hope um, as they look at the temple laying in ruins. He talks about the temple laying in ruins. He talks about uh, the Messiah to come and things like that. But just keep that into perspective. Because remember, what we're talking about here, um, here he is talking about a people that are trying to rebuild with shattered pieces. Now, they've come through a lot. You know? You, you know the story of when you look at the history of God's people, how they responded to God's love, what they do. They frequently disobeyed his law. They frequently worshipped other idols. They, they frequently just continued to rebel. Uh, and then we know, of course, that um, punishment happened. They were delivered into exile. And then they were carried off to a foreign land in captivity seven year, 70 years in Babylon. And then we see a glimmer of hope. Uh, the Emperor Cyrus of Persia allows the Jews to return back to their homeland. And about 50,000 return, which seems like a lot, but of a million people, roughly, that wasn't, a, per se, a lot. And they arrive back, and then they look at it, how do we restart? I mean, the devastation that must have been in their mind when they return to their homeland, and they see everything desolate, all the things they valued, destroyed, everything all grown up, uh, basically no people in the land. And then they had to begin the process of rebuilding. What was it going to happen? And then we know from previous we're talking about, they begin to uh, lay an altar on the ground where the temple was, they're going to rebuild the temple, but then, then they face opposition. You know, the, the people around them came against them to try to stop them from rebuilding the temple. The new king tried to stop them from relaying the temple. Uh, and they got kind of discouraged, and they then started building their own homes, and before you know it, about 20 years has passed, the temple still lays in ruins. Uh, and then we see now uh, Zechariah and also Haggai come on the scene, and they're going to encourage them and spur them on to, okay, let's get going. Let's get this temple rebuilt. Uh, and so that's the, the uh, context in which everything is going on in this book. You know, uh, Zechariah, if you realize this or not, it was actually quoted about 40 times in the New Testament. So this is a, a big, big heavy hitter as far as New Testament writers. They refer to Zechariah an awful lot. You know, when you think of New Testament, they will frequently refer to prophets like Isaiah and, the, and, and the Psalms. Those are big kind of heavy hitters you see a lot in the New Testament. But Zechariah, uh, Zechariah, you see him a lot also referred to about 40 some times into the, the New Testament. And again, he would have been a contemporary of Haggai, where God uses Haggai and Zechariah to stir up his people to get moving on to be the people God has called them to be. Um, and there, he's pretty profound. Even uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, if you read the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, they mention the ministry of Zechariah. And so he was a profound figure in uh, the Jewish history, for sure. Uh, and what we're going to do here is we'll walk through just touching on some of the chapters and things like that to give you a better understanding of what's happening. So before we go to chapter 1, realize that chapters 1 through 6, there's about eight visions, or even through 1 through 8 you could argue, but the first handful of chapters uh, are all about these visions that he has concerning the rebuilding of the temple. 
And so you're going to see these odd visions that might seem odd, but if you take your time, read them slowly, they will make more sense to you. But they're all about um, the visions of rebuilding God's temple, right? They're to rebuild God's temple, and so we have some of these visions talking about some of these things. Uh, the main emphasis is this. God is at work. That, that God is doing something. God is not full abandon the people, and he is going to protect them, lead them, and um, help him into the, the space of what God is doing, what he is leading his people to do. So chapter 1, here we go. Chapter 1, again, quick overviews. Uh, this is a call to return to the Lord. So as you begin this whole book, it's a call to return to the Lord. Let's go to verses 1 through 4, Zechariah verses 1 um, through 4. It says this, In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Edo. The Lord was very angry with your ancestors. Therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your ancestors to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Turn from your evil ways and your evil practices, but they would not listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. You know, and as you remember, the big focus here is rebuilding the temple. Uh, but even more so, what's interesting is what Zechariah, Zechariah is saying here is they need a change of heart. It wasn't just about building the temple, rebuilding the temple. Like, that's important. I mean, remember how crucial the temple was to the Jewish people. It signified God's unique covenant with them, his, his presence with them. Uh, and it, being it laying in ruins kind of did not speak well to who they were called to be as God's people, especially to other, other nations around them. Uh, but even more, he says here, he, he says, don't be like your ancestors. I mean, they had the temple, and that didn't seem to solve the problem, right? He says, return to me. And so here, the big thing we see is they needed a change of heart. You know, just rebuilding the building was a, a big thing, and they were called to do that. Uh, but if you thought the temple was magically going to make them all good, he says, well, remember, don't be like your ancestors. Um, he was angry with your ancestors. Uh, and he says, return to me, and I will return to you. You know, um, he, he said, you need to be fully committed to the Lord. Fully committed, turn back to him. None of this wishy-washy stuff. And you know, from the past, they were um, mixing their religions and things, where they were still worshiping God, but they were still worshiping the stars and other pagan gods and things like that. But right away, he says, kicks it off and says, return to me. And I return to you. It's about the heart. You know, the building is there. Like, yeah, we're going to rebuild the temple. We're called to do that. Um, but even more so, examine the heart. Is it fully committed to the Lord? Because the ancestors, they had the temple. But yeah. Okay. Uh, and then, in starting in verse 7, which is not up there, I don't believe yet, you're going to see a series of visions regarding the rebuilding of the temple. Um, one being something called, um, the one vision was a man among the myrtle trees. If you've read this, it's in a vision about a man among the myrtle trees. And we're not going to read it today because it's, it's you know, a little longer. Um, but that vision of this man uh, among these myrtle trees leads to these verses in 16 and 17 and then 18 and 21. So uh, 16 through 17 says this, Therefore, this is what the Lord says, I will return to Jerusalem with mercy, and there my house will be rebuilt, and the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem, declares the Lord Almighty. Proclaim further, this is what the Lord Almighty says, my towns will again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. Verse 18, then I looked up, and there before me were four horns. I asked the angel, who was speaking to me? What are these? He answered, these are the horns that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. I asked, what are these coming to do? He answered, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could raise their head, but the craftsmen have come to terrify them and throw them down these horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter its people. Uh, and here you have this vision about four horns, right? Essentially, quick overview, the four horns... These would be nations that kind of held uh, God's people under their thumb. You know, they were uh, bullying them, terrorizing them, oppressing them. These were the things. Now, it's interesting is why do we see horns? And I think 
probably the best reason you often see horns symbolized in the Old Testament especially is in an agricultural society where you plowed by oxen, nothing was more powerful than a bull, right? And so you'll frequently see images of horns used to symbolize power, you know? And so it's kind of a way that we would say modern day of a bulldozer, right? Uh, and so keep that in mind when you see this about horns and um, the nations that were oppressing them. But God is going to do something to scatter them and to bring about his people. Now going to chapter 2, uh, we see chapter 2, we see this vision of a man with a measuring line, which is an interesting thing. So go to verses 1 through 2, and chapter 2 says this. Then I looked up, and there before me was a man with a measuring line in his hand. I asked, what are you, or where are you going? He answered, to measure Jerusalem to find out how wide and how long it is. Uh, and this third vision of a measuring line, it's uh, a line over Jerusalem because Jerusalem is going to expand and grow. So just keep that in mind as you, as you see this. And then go to verse 7 through 13. Uh, it says, Actually, we don't need to read all of it because it's, it's pretty, it's, it's kind of longer and we have a lot to go through. Uh, but essentially here, it's again, God coming to uh, rescue, to save his people, um, to li live among you. You can even see in verse 10, it says, Shout and be glad, daughter Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Uh, and so you see, again, this is what God is, is doing for his people. Uh, again, we're just kind of flying high today over some of these things. Chapter 3, we see clean garments for the high priest. So now we're getting into this. Go to verses 1 through 5 in chapter 3. It says this, then he, show, uh, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is it not this man, a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him, with the angel of the Lord stood by. Which is uh, essentially this vision. You have this vision of Joshua, the high priest, uh, in the in these dirty garments, he also served uh, among alongside uh, Zerubbabel, which we've seen. He was kind of the governor, uh, and so here he is in these dirty garments and this vision of the cleansing of the high priest. Essentially, this would be symbolic of the cleansing of the nation. That God is cleansing not only the high priest but cleansing the nation. And we again we see a picture of a God who what takes away their filth, takes away uh, the, the the sin. Um, and there's restoration there, and so just keep that in mind. But also kind of an interesting side note is in this vision, you see Satan standing there, and he's accusing, you know, and that's what Satan does. You know, Satan is the accuser. That's what one of the words names for him is, the accuser. Or really, uh, the name for Satan or Satan uh, would be the adversary. And so, essentially, like, we have to realize in this idea of spiritual warfare here that Satan will try to oppose anything you do for the Lord. You know, if you want to do something for the Lord, if you want to do kingdom work, don't be surprised if you see it be challenging. Don't be surprised if there's pushback. Don't be surprised. Because again, in the spiritual realm of things, Satan will not like that. Uh, and so you see the accusations here going on. And uh, maybe some of you experience that in your own life, where you're trying to get closer to God, you're trying to do more for the ministry, more for the kingdom, and it just seems like pff, there's like an uptick in frustrations or challenges or, or whatever it might be. Um, and I, I'd say just be on guard, keep your eyes open, you don't have to find a demon behind every bush kind of thing, and I'm not talking about but realize that when we read the Bible, spiritual warfare is a very real thing. And it happens in our lives, whether you're aware of it or not. And there are um, things going on in the unseen realm that we're not fully aware of. Uh, and if you read the Bible closely, you will see that um, Satan um, and the dominion which he uh, is part of or controls of anyways, or has some dominion over, uh, they do not like it when God's people try to raise up and do things for God and just keep that in mind. But what's interesting here too is um, he says, the Lord rebuke you. Uh, might, might be a, a, a principle, I think, maybe in terms of like, you know, when, when you're engaging in this kind of spiritual warfare, um, 
could you apply that when you, you know, the Lord rebuke you when you're speaking it out, you know, to, to, to um, whatever powers that be that might be um, meddling or, or trying to do some stuff. Uh, and again, maybe we're, our minds aren't conditioned to realize this because uh, we've been conditioned in this Western Christianity. We don't think much about the spiritual warfare or the unseen realm thing. But if you read scripture, this is very much a very real thing uh, that, uh, that, you know, Jesus frequently came up against in his ministry uh, when he was uh, engaging in this stuff. But nevertheless, just keep this in mind. Like, yeah, we have the authority and power to say, you know, Satan, get behind me in Jesus' name and, and all of that kind of stuff. But realize who gives you the authority, who gives you the power to do that. Here, he said, the Lord rebuke you. So he's relying not on his own, like, strength or ability, but on the Lord's. And I think it's important when you think about terms of spiritual warfare and when you th- think about um, uh, speaking back. And one of the ways you can fight back, of course, is God's Word. It's, it's the sword. There's power in that. I, I can tell you people who have engaged in spiritual warfare firsthand um, were people that were um, uh, suffering from demonic oppression or things like that. That when, And again, uh, people that confirmed it was that. It wasn't just like a psychological illness. We're talking about things flying across the room and stuff like that. But when they speak God's word and the authority of Jesus, um, these things respond the way they did in the Bible. They, they do not like that because um, there's power and authority in Jesus' name. Uh, and, um, but different topic, just be aware of this. We see a principle here of um, Satan being the adversary. We see um, rebuking Satan in Jesus' name and the authority that was, was given in that. Um, but nevertheless... Uh, chapter 4 now, we get into uh, the gold lampstand and two olive trees. It's a vision. Uh, it's the fifth vision that we see here, that he's, he's seeing here. And there's a lot in it. And we'll, we'll pull out some, some high points anyway. So go to Zechariah verse or chapter 4, verse 1, says this. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke up. Like someone awakened from sleep, he asked, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my lord, I replied. Verse six, so he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by my might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Now, just, just keep that in mind here. Uh, not by might, nor power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Hmm. And then jump down to verse 11. We'll skip through. Verse 11 says this. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out gold oil, golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Uh, and so there's a lot of stuff going on there, but, uh, which is very interesting. But one of the things we'll focus on here is not by might... Uh, but by your power, by the power of the Spirit. Can you go jump back to verse 6 there? Just jump back real quick. I think it was verse, we have verse 6. It says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And so they're saying, okay, whatever obstacles you're going to face in rebuilding the temple, just do it. Just do it. Don't make excuses. We don't, have, we don't have the ability. We don't have the resources. We don't have the power. We don't have whatever. He says, no, no. Well, you're going to accomplish it. You're going to rebuild it. But not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. You know, and in your own lives, uh, we have to realize, you know what? When you rely, when we start relying more on God's power of the Holy Spirit and less on our own abilities or smarts or power, you will see more kingdom things happen that way. You know, so don't sit back and say, oh, I could never do that. You know, I, I don't have the resources. I don't have the power. I don't have I don't have the skill. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I don't have the whatever to to do what God is calling you to do. The principle here is if God is calling you to it, he'll get you through it. Right. God has equipped you. And so as Christians, we have to really stay, take a step back and say, OK, Lord, what is your will? Um, empower me in, in accomplishing in this. And then we go in faith and do it. 
you know? Uh, and that's where a real tricky balance can sometimes come. And, and sometimes that's where sometimes churches, we even as a church can mess up, right? Because we want to get all this stuff done by having the slickest programs and the coolest advertising and the coolest uh, services and the, uh, and the coolest, you know, activities and fun things and whatever that might be. And that's all good and fine. But if you're not a church that actually is operating and led by the Holy Spirit, you can do a whole lot of stuff without actually doing a lot of kingdom stuff, right? And so we as a church and as a people individually, we need to do a better job of not just jumping and say, what do we want to do? But say, God, what do you want to do through us? And then we rely solely on His power, His Spirit, and not say, oh, we could never do that. You know, we've never done that before. We don't have the resources to do that. We don't, you know, whatever. Um, but again, it's got to be, what is, the God, God is, what is God leading? But also, too, remember from last week's message, what's the priority, right? Not everything we, we, we want to do might be a priority for kingdom stuff. Uh, but that's, again, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit as Christians. If we do more in relying on His power than our power, we will be greatly, greatly served. And you'll see much more accomplished for the kingdom than we can do in our own strength. Because again, I love that verse. We should just highlight that. You know, uh, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Uh, just get it done. God will give you what you need to get it done. Uh, and uh, there's a few more visions, you know, all the same theme. We're not going to get into too much, really. Um, verse 5, or chapter 5, rather, we see this flying scroll. So go to chapter 5, this flying scroll and a woman in a basket. There's some visions here. Um, essentially, this flying scroll, and this probably symbolizes God's law, um, which condemns sin. And this flying scroll is flying and it's unrolled. It's unrolled for everybody to see. It's not rolled up for only the priest to read, which is an interesting note that you might want to take note of uh, when, you're, when you're reading this chapter. Uh, chapter 6, we see this vision of uh, four, four chariots and a crown for Joshua in chapter 6. And then that kind of ends that section there. Um, you could probably go into a little bit more into the next ones, but we'll just kind of break it up that way. Uh, now we're going to get into chapters 7 and 8, address the quality of life that God wants for his people. Right? This is kind of talking about um, God's renewed people and the quality of life that he wants them to have. Uh, and they contain some encouraging promises for Israel. So chapter 7, justice and mercy, not fasting, which is um, very, very interesting. Uh, so let's go to chapter 7. 4 through 11 says this, Then the word of the Lord Almighty came to me, Ask all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh, seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? And when you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? Are these not the words the Lord proclaimed through the earlier prophets when Jerusalem and its surrounding towns were at rest and prosperous, and the Negev and the western foothills were settled? Verse 8, And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty said, Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. But they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly they turned their backs and covered their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or to the words the Lord Almighty had sent by His Spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. You know, and while in exile, uh, the Jews would frequently mourn and fast as a remembrance of the siege that happened on Jerusalem. They would frequently do this. And now they're asking, okay, now that we've returned to Jerusalem, should we still continue to mourn and fast? Uh, and Zechariah gives his answer later on in um, chapter 8, verse 19. It says, now the time for, for um, feasting, right? And, and so we, we see this here. Um, be saying that the, uh, fasting should be replaced by feasting, essentially. But what we really want to see as we read this is Zechariah is warning that religious ceremonies however proper they are, are meaningless unless people's lives are controlled by God. That's really what we're seeing here. However proper your religious ceremonies are, are completely worthless and meaningless unless your lives are actually controlled by God. 
You know, we've seen this principle time and time again. You know what I mean? And so it's nothing really maybe new, but there's a reason why we keep seeing it as a, a repeat theme because people tend to need hit over the head a million times to actually, oh, this is probably important to God, you know? Um, but nevertheless, uh, this is what he's talking about here. And, uh, you know, you see the, the idea of what a, what a God really want, you know? I mean, he, he, you see this, uh, not oppressing the widow or the fatherless or the foreigners, not plotting evil against each other, uh, showing mercy and compassion. Uh, and so again, this is kind of a real faith that is acceptable to God. Not just lip service, not just ritualistic routine stuff, but a faith that where God is actually in control of your life, you know, uh, where it really makes a difference in how you live your life, how you treat people. That kind of is the theme that we see here. Chapter 8 now we see um, the Lord promises to bless Jerusalem. Go to 8.23, says this, This is what the Lord Almighty says, In those days, ten people from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let's go with you because we have heard that God is with you. That's an interesting thing, you know what I mean? Like Now Zechariah is, is, is fix, fixing his vision to a far beyond hope here that we see, a glorious future, a time when Jerusalem will be a light to the world, when, when people from all nations will stream into the city. I mean, can you imagine that, that picture here? People, it says, um, the, uh, from every language, nation will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let's go with you because we have heard that God is with you. Can you imagine people just grabbing on to, to and say, okay, we're, we're going with you because we know God is with you. We know your, who your God is. We know what he's done. We know what he's doing. We know he's real. We're going with you. You know what I mean? Can you imagine someone in your, people in your own life like just doing that? I mean, imagine you go to work or you're going to the grocery store or whatever it might be. And let's just say, I don't know, maybe you're wearing a cross or something like that. And imagine someone just grabbing hold of you and saying, I'm going with you. I know your God is real. I, I know it. Like I, There's no doubt. I know he's real. I know what he's done. I know what he's doing. I'm going with you wherever you're going. Let's go. Um, that's the kind of mentality mindset that we have here that, that is coming one day when people will realize who God is, what he's done, um, but nevertheless. Now, um, it's kind of a more glorious future thing. We're all right. We're almost done. We're closing up. Chapters 9 through 11, not on chapter 9 yet, but before we get into it, uh, now these chapters, um, these are the messianic portions of Zechariah about the coming Messiah, where essentially we're going to see the first arrival of the Messiah, the second coming of the Messiah, and then we're going to see the kingdom age, the kingdom that, God's kingdom that will reign forever. And so you're going to see a lot of um, messianic kind of, of things here. Uh, there's some puzzling things in these chapters about the struggle that Israel is going to go through. Um, you'll find predictions from terrible suffering to victory, so you'll see some of this mixed in here. Uh, and, and, and these chapters, especially, you see them cited a lot even by New Testament writers. Uh, New Testament writers will frequently refer back to some of these as a way of understanding Jesus' last days and Jesus' uh, death and resurrection. So you'll frequently see them talking about some of these uh, messianic prophecies, and they will look back and, and use that as a way to understand what was going on in the ministry of Jesus. So go to chapter 9. We see um, judgment on Israel's enemies. Chapter 9, 9 through 10, this is about the, the um, coming of Zion's king. So, uh, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Verse 10. Uh, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim uh, and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. He will rule... His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now, there's a lot there, but essentially what we seem to see here is like two sections. So the first section, I'm sure many of you probably right away recognize that section, right? In Matthew, when Jesus rides into town on 
the donkey, right? We see that because they actually, they, they quote this when he does that, right? Remember that? When, when he's riding in, about to enter the city, this kind of royal entry where he tells them to go and, and untie the colt, the colt and um, uh, the donkey and, and come in, they're going to ride in. And then they quote this chapter, verse 9 here as the way of saying, essentially, this is being fulfilled in what Jesus is doing, right? Um, so that's the first section. Now, it's also interesting is if you remember that in Matthew, uh, I think it's Matthew 26, maybe I can't, um, I can't remember, or even Luke, Luke, 9, 9, Luke 19, maybe. I'm just trying to remember offhand. Luke 19 for sure, I think. But nevertheless, um, Jesus actually essentially holds them accountable, saying that they should have recognized that this was him. Like, they should have known the time. They should have known, because guess what? Just go to Zechariah, you know, 9-9, nine, nine, and you should have realized this is what is happening here, right? And so he kind of holds them accountable for what's going on. But now, you, you jump down now to verse 10. See, there's that break there. In that break, it seems to be a big, big um, pause. Maybe thousands of years pause kind of a thing. Because now we're seeing... The time when um, uh, the coming, where 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 the, the people are are fully seemingly redeemed and saved here, Ephraim is just a way of of saying Israel essentially because Ephraim was one of the largest tribes in Israel, and so when you see this here, uh, the Messiah's peaceful reign after the second coming that you see, and we we see this mentioned in like in Isaiah chapter two when he talks about them beating their their weapons into plowshares, right? This kind of reign of peace. Um, and so just keep this in mind. But also, this doesn't seem to be the first time that this happens, where you have these two pictures in, in a verse, because um, seemingly, remember when Jesus reads the scroll, Isaiah 61, he reads the first, he reads the one section, and then he closes it up, rolls it up, and or puts it down. Um, so he reads the part regarding the arrival, but it doesn't finish the part in terms of the peaceful reign to come. And so there seemingly is this pause of thousands of years, but essentially what you have seemingly here is the first coming, and then the pause, thousands of years pause, and then a picture of the second coming, uh, a time of peace. But just keep that in mind, trying to understand and read this. Uh, chapter 10, uh, you see now uh, that uh, the Lord will care for Judah. So chapter 10 um, basically speaks of blessings of the future kingdom. Uh, chapter 11 now is a very interesting chapter. You see a picture of the rejection of the king. The rejection of the king. It's, there's some interesting things you can pull out in here really quickly. Chapter 11, go to 10 through 14. Then I took my staff, called favor, and broke it, revoking the covenant I had made with all the nations. It was revoked on that day, and so the oppressed of the flock who were watching me knew it was the word of the Lord. I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them at the potter at the house of the Lord. Then I broke my second staff called Union, breaking the family bond between Judah and and Israel. Uh, and essentially what you have here is uh, painting a picture of the Messiah saying, you know, kind of as a shepherd, if you will, but the Messiah saying, okay, what, what am I worth to you? Like, what's my value to you? And of course, he would expect them to say, oh, you have immeasurable worth. You have insurpassable worth, right? Um, but no, uh, they, they paid him, they gave him 30 pieces of silver. Essentially, <laughs> they're saying that you are worth less than a slave. Worth less than a slave. You say, well, how do you, how do you gather that from, from that? Uh, in, Numbers, in Numbers chapter 31, 30 pieces of silver is what you pay someone for a slave gored by an ox. So if you have a slave gored by an ox, you pay them 30 pieces of silver. And so the people respond, instead of saying you have unsurpassable worth, they say, yeah, you're basically you're, you're worth less than a slave to us. You're worth less than a slave. That's the value that, that you have. Um, but also it's interesting, in Matthew chapter 27, Judas takes 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus Christ, right? And then what happens? Well, we know after he feels the regret, he then goes and throws it into the house of the Lord. He throws the silver in there. And since, well, he can't take it. Well, they, 
not going to do anything with it, so what do they do? The leaders decide to buy a potter's field with that money. And then we know what happens. Then Judas goes and hangs himself in that potter's field. Very, very interesting connections when you see how some of these things um, can be related. Uh, but nevertheless, just kind of a, a quick overview. Uh, and now uh, finishing up 12, 13, and 14, these chapters are about the se- second coming of the Messiah and the kingdom age and the last battle of the nations that are going to gather against the Jews in the end of the days. Um, chapter 13, we see a cleansing of sin. So chapter 13, we'll see um, cleansing from sin. Uh, ch- Actually, did I go to chapter 12? I might skip chapter 12, maybe. Chapter 12, Jerusalem's enemies destroyed. 13, cleansing from the sin. And then lastly, 14, finishing up, the Lord comes and reigns. Get a picture of this in Zechariah 14, 3 through 4 says this. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split into two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. Fast forward to the New Testament. When Jesus ascends into heaven, he does it from the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem. Right? Remember that? And then when the men are looking up, what happens? We know the angel appears and tell them, men, why are you staring up into heaven? The same Jesus, the witness, he will return the same way, right? And we see the return when he returns, when his feet touches the Mount of Olives, it is split into two, which is interesting. Um, a lot of biblical scholars will have some different opinions and thoughts on um, the meaning of this chapter and the symbolism behind this chapter. Uh, but one thing is clear as you read all this, regardless of how you interpret some of this, uh, the result of earth's turmoil will be good news for people that follow God. You know, that's what you see here in terms of tracing the line of what's going on. Uh, go to 14, 8 through 9, says this, On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it east to the Dead Sea and half of it west of the Mediterranean Sea, in summer and in winter. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord in his name, the only name. Uh, And done. So that's what you have there. A, a, A broad, quick picture of what's going on here in the book of Zechariah. You see the context. You see each chapter. You see some of the meanings. You see uh, the focus on the temple, but also the focus on the change of heart. And you see the messianic, uh, uh, prophecies and speaking of, of what's going on and where it's leading to the Lord being Lord over all and it is good news for all of those who love the Lord who follow the Lord um, that he is do- doing a good thing right renewal reconciliation so that is the book of Zechariah again overview I encourage you to read it on your own it's only 14 chapters which is Decent, but not too, too crazy long compared to some of the other books we have been through. Um, this will hopefully help you better understand stuff as you read it on your own. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for every single person that's here. God, as we read your word, Father, help us to spend time in it, to allow your word to just Fill us, Father, to allow your Spirit to fill us, that we be a Spirit-led, Spirit-driven people, and that we never forget the big picture. Never make Christianity or your Word into a a narcissistic thing where it's just about me and my happiness or even just my salvation and going to heaven because there's a much, much bigger plan at stake here. We're talking about your purpose for the world, of redeeming the world, of rescuing the world, of restoring all things to you, including ourselves. And there is a a cosmic battle going on. There is spiritual warfare going on. Father, let us put our hope in you. Let us walk in your spirit and also keep in a vision, keep our eyes open to see the bigger picture of who you are, what you've done, what you are doing, and what you're going to do. And let us never lose sight and never lose hope in that. Because we see... Zechariah and Haggai speaking this to your people who were were struggling. It was offering a hope, an encouragement, also a call to live for you. We thank you and praise you in your son Jesus' name. Amen.